Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live with Danica Joan and my co-host, Wendy Perry. Today's special guest is Bill Coleman. It, he has an amazing heroic story of um, being kind of bullied around by the, the judicial system. And there's just so much to it. So I want to go ahead and jump right in to his story. Uh, I first want to welcome you and then, um, and then show a little news clip uh, um, around the media that covered your story. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Danica, and thank you, Wendy, for having me on the show. It's, um, it's great to be able to be here and share the story. And you are, you are actually, we're interviewing you. Um, you're in the UK, is that right? I'm in Liverpool, home of the European champions. <laughs> wow. I tell you what, this is truly the topics that we cover around parental alienation and these you know, high conflict custody situations are truly a global conversation. Um, and it affects men and women alike. Wendy and I are definitely, uh, we bring to light that it is not a gender conversation. It's something where we both genders should unite, unite mothers and fathers should unite against bullying, unite against um, the alienating behaviors because the children are ultimately the victims in the situation. Um, Okay, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to play the uh, the news um, story and let everybody listen. A Connecticut prison inmate who's been on a hunger strike for 16 months is in court defending his right not to eat. Prison officials have force fed him several times, saying his health is their responsibility. And ECN Brian Burnell reports. 48-year-old William Coleman listens to testimony in his lawsuit against the Connecticut Department of Correction. Coleman is on a hunger strike and sued the department when it force-fed him, both intravenously and twice through a tube run through his nose and into his stomach. He says he was wrongly convicted of raping a woman close to him. A friend of Coleman says the starvation is his way of drawing attention. Bill wants the media attention. He wants you here to cover the story because we know that there is someone in the judicial system in the state of Connecticut that will actually take a look at the case other than the state. Kinsley says Coleman has lost 100 pounds, but that while his appearance has changed, he is perfectly sane. She says he's concerned not only about his own case, but injustice in general. He doesn't want to die, but he's willing to die if at some point something will get done. The American Civil Liberties Union is arguing on Coleman's behalf against the state's assertion that it has the right to force feed him. The attorneys say the hunger strike is a time-honored form of peaceful protest and is protected as free speech. Mr. Coleman is trying to make a point um, that there are some problems with the judicial system that result in, in him being where he is today um, and uh, the position that his children are in. Um, and he's trying to make a point that something needs to be done about it, not just for his case, but for others. Kinsley says with the exception of his gaunt appearance, Coleman has not changed. He, he is still the Bill Coleman that I know and love and always will. For Coleman, this is all about raising awareness of what he calls corruption and injustice in the Connecticut judicial system. For the corrections department, it's about stopping an inmate from hurting himself. And for the ACLU, it's about protecting the right to free speech. The case will resume next week when Coleman himself is likely to take the stand. In Hartford, Connecticut, Brian Burnell, NECN. Okay. All right. There Brings you back go. sad memories. Wow. It, it's very sad to watch it. It, it really is. It's, so what year was that, Bill, just for our viewers so that they have uh, the, a time the, frame? Yeah, the year of that trial um, would have been somewhere around about 2010. Don't quote me on it. Mm -hmm. These are um, memories I've suppressed in many ways, similar to that of my children. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's not something I, you know, I would look, I've got all the documentation, of course, and could easily look, but I would say somewhere around 2010. It's not something I've thought about for a very, very long time sure. for mental health reasons. Sure. Well, we appreciate you coming on Custody Matters Live and talking about it because um, I think it's understandable why you would suppress some of those memories. And uh, so we really appreciate you not talking with us about it. So. I'm not completely familiar with the details of your case and your situation. So um, were you in a, a custody 
battle I saw in the video, it said that there were rape allegations mm-hmm. that came forward during a custody battle. So were you in custody uh, modification or litigation? And that's when these allegations came forward? Um, I'll start by saying that I would say to your viewers, you know, um, go online and get all the details because there is just so much of it. And to try and nutshell it is just very difficult. Um, My wife, two years earlier, had abducted our children Mm. um, after the death of her father, and it took the Hague Convention in a year to get them back. I was awarded uh, residential custody, um, and from there, I thought we were repairing our marriage, and I took a lot of blame for what went wrong in our marriage, um, including her, ultimately her affair that really was the next catalyst to all this. Um, And unfortunately, um, it it spiraled out of control when she didn't come home one weekend. And I filed a missing police report because she should have been back, you know, after a work thing on a Saturday. Uh, One thing led to another. On the Sunday, a car broke down, um, which I got accused of not letting her have her car. And I spent the entire week fixing it, going backwards, which a a female, and I have to say this, everything I'm saying has been 100% ratified and proven as true by Judge Linda Munro, who's the high uh, high conflict uh, judge in the regional family uh, trial docket in Connecticut. And every word and everything that I say, I wish that would have been my criminal trial, but it wasn't, unfortunately. So um, she begged me not to divorce her. We went down to the courthouse on the Monday morning um, because I said I couldn't trust her anymore. And that's when I filed for sole custody of the children. Uh, And she agreed to that until such time I felt, you know, I could trust again. And um, then, unbeknownst to me, she hired a lawyer, called the police, and asked what she needed to do if she had been raped. And that had been on the Tuesday and the Wednesday. And believe it or not, that came out in the, my arraignment uh, the following week. And yet yeah, I was convicted of raping her on the Wednesday night, Thursday morning. So short of my wife being clairvoyant, um, uh, how can I rape her after um, she'd called the police? <laughs> it just, it's not logical. And they, they knew this. And it, there's a lot of other factors that, you know, I pass polygraph psych and sexual testing and everything else. Um, but there's a lot of other factors that substantiate um, my, um, my claim on that. And it all came out in that, in that trial, but in that family court trial. But unfortunately, the only thing that went against me in the family court trial, which lasted two weeks, were the orders. Um, Judge Munro because of the pendant charges, um, awarded her everything, including the children. Um, but she did say there was a powerful statement, which I was told was legalese for, she didn't believe a word Jill said, which was um, the, um, the, the, the matter of the, you know, words to this effect, I'm paraphrasing, the guilt of the um, um, defendant is um, will ultimately be decided in a criminal trial, but it's not one this court can't, uh, can't answer without questions. So in other words, as a female, as a woman, she would have nailed me to a coffin for a criminal trial if she felt I did it. And she didn't believe a word Jill said. So that's pretty, in a nutshell, that's it. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of, there's so many details. It, it, it was many, many years that, you know, your story, this particular part of your, of your story. So we can't cover all of the details in 30 minutes. Um, but one question that pops into my mind, so maybe it's popping into our viewers' minds, is I'm wondering, um, was your accuser, was she um, connected to anyone who uh, was uh, in politics or involved with the judicial system? Did she have some kind of a, a connection that... Um, created some kind of bias or favor for her no but she was connected to somebody um money um Mm -hmm. from her place of employment 
who I believe funded a lot of things. Um, she'd conned the guy that she was um, um, with, who from all, it is going to sound shallow to say this, but this is the words of a family court relations lady who doesn't seem worldly and not in her league, quote unquote. Um, you know, so uh, it, 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 she was manipulating a great number of people. And, um, you know, as I've said to many people, I believe her. That's the type of person that she is. You would, you, you would think that in talking to her. But um, I remember on one conversation I had with her trying to work all this out. And she said, Bill, I'm a liar. I know I'm a liar. But she can say that to me. But I know nobody else was hearing that. So... Um, and, and she, she's from about, she's from a family that are like that. Well, something I want to focus on, because the thing is, is there, there's to try to get away from the personalities of, you know, that we have, obviously it seems like there are some people who definitely charm their way into believability. Um, and, but, but ultimately it is the responsibility of the courts to do the right thing, not do the subjective thing, not to do what's most popular, not even, um, even if the facts are in front of us and you may not, you know, the judge may not like that person, they still have to base it on facts, not subjectivity. And right. it seems like that is the way of the courts. Even the legislators are trying to put, put, legislation in place um, to guide the courts, but yet the, the courts almost have, have it that they're going to do what they want to do. And it seems like in family court, it's very subjective. Yes. And I think you can answer that question on or that line on so many different ways. Um, PAS, parental alienation syndrome, is a horrific thing. And what happens to children in parental alienation situations is um, the studies are out there. There's been parliamentary studies here in the UK. There's been presidential ones in the US, you know, uh, I mean, and the, and the outcome, more children get pregnant, uh, more children drop out of school, do drugs, uh, end up in crime, this, that, and the other. The, the, the statistics are just unbelievable, to say the least. Um and I, I've said this to you, Danica, off um, air when we've spoken privately. Um, I'm sad to say I'm glad more women are becoming alienated from their children because without women, without mothers, we're not going to defeat parental alienation. If this was just down to men and fathers, I think it's collateral damage for the money that uh, the, I've, I've, I've read one study. Sorry. I, I get what you're saying, and, mm -hmm. and of course, that could totally inflame our female audience. <laughs> yes, I know, but it's true. What you're saying is that historically, it was the structure of the family that the women took care of the children, the man yes. by the money, and whenever a relationship didn't work out, the when, women, it was just assumed that the women would continue to take care of the children, and yes. historically, um, it was, yes. they... Parental alienation, the first coined phrase was mad mommy syndrome. And mm. it was because men didn't stand a chance of um, getting custody of the children back in the 80s. And uh, who best to be the most effective alienator but the one that has custody of the children? Exactly. And, and, it, and I can give that an actual name. It's called the Tender Years Doctrine. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's been pendulums. Back in the old, old days, men had the jobs. So um, when there was a divorce, men had the money, so men got the children. And this is, I'm talking about, you know, 1800s, mm -hmm. whatever, 1900s. But then once the uh, Tender Years Doctrine kicked in and there was money to be made, it was better to give the children to the mom who could devote the time seemingly uh, outside of the war years when women would at work in, in masses. And, and therefore the father would then, you know, so it, on the surface you would say that was okay as long as everybody's getting equal time. But what began to happen, it became a tool and a weapon and so on and so forth. And I think even still today it's like 80-20 or 75-25. It's been as high as 
probably 85 or 90 percent the alienated parent is the father but i have said from the get-go without the mothers um who are affected by alienated uh, alienation and the, the mothers of those men also or the sisters or the nieces or without women in general mm -hmm. it's not going to end it just won't and and women are now being more affected by alienation by a, um, um, a father or a man or and a father who has alienated them and as that goes on the rise and everybody starts to see this ugly monster for what it is because we all want to protect women you know society does men do it's in our nature i mean we can't get away from who we are uh, feminists hate that by the way <laughs> but no that's true it's innate in me it, you know i'm more likely to help a woman in distress than i am a guy you know but, but that's what we want to do but women who are now finding themselves in that position people are now going to want to help them and that's where laws will get changed and, and I, I, I totally agree with you. It, it should not be a gender-based issue. This is parental alienation, whoever the parent is. Um, but I think that, that realization, that coming together and, and mothers and fathers uh, you know, equally going at this, I want all the men to hear this loud and clear. We're not gonna win it without moms. We're just not. We're not gonna, we're not gonna defeat parental alienation without mm -hmm. women, and without mothers. End I'm, of story. I'm so glad you're saying that because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of what you're trying to say is, is that we need all of our voices. We need the dad's voices. We need the mom's voices. Right. We all need to be um, educating people about this. Absolutely. Um, we need to be, and, and we hear it all the time in our circles, we need to be united. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually think that we are already quite united. Um, okay. But but we need all of our voices, moms and dads. Right, and it, it, the, you can get into things like um, if alienated mothers want to see what it's like ultimately in the masses of alienated fathers, just go look at the male suicide rates. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, un, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. I mean, at one point on some of my groups, we were losing a father a week. I mean, it was that bad. And, and it will get to that stage for, for some of these mothers. I, I think some of the alienation a lot of mothers experience, um, other than from um, fathers, is because there are a lot of single moms and they get involved with CPS uh, around the world and they become the alienators. So, so single moms have that side of it too and that shouldn't be forgotten. But that feeling is still the same. For no reason they've lost children. In their lives and um you know and i understand there's a job to do to protect children and 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 that's wonderful um however when it when it's simply for no reason and for some reason a child's been taken away from from a, a mom or a dad for no reason it's just as horrific as if it was your partner your ex-partner you know it is interesting you know in dependency court where children children are taken out because of abuse or neglect and put into a foster home the um a, ch a parent a biological parent is not put on supervised visitation uh, unless they've actually been deemed guilty of something of abuse or neglect but yet in family court they just you know because they want to to go on the side of protecting the child and in um against the the what if this could happen they put the child they put the parent on a supervised visitation schedule exactly and you're like well wait a minute this parent didn't do anything wrong uh and yet they're being treated in the same vein as if they were an abusive or neglectful parent and their child is being protected by the foster system which is exactly what happened to me at the start. Um, I had to, before there was any trials of any description, it took me a year to see my children again. And by that time, they said, well, you haven't seen them in a year. So <laughs> the mere, there's this false allegation, which even if it was true, hadn't been to a, a court of any description, but it was false, obviously. But the length of time it took was reason to put me on supervised visitation. Unbelievable. 
which okay, was making so, the alienation even worse. All right, so let's reframe that. If you haven't, if you're a child and you haven't seen your grandparents in over a year, would you? <laughs> It just seems absurd. A parent would not say, well, you know, before you can visit with your grandparents, you have to have some supervised visitation because we don't want to traumatize you by sending exactly. you to grandma's house. Exactly. And that, that's exactly right. And this is why it's a, it's a spiral staircase in a downward direction, especially for children. Um, and this is why uh, the message that needs to go. I mean, we're all preaching to the choir here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all birds of a feather. Everybody who's listening, watching uh, us here. Uh, it, but it, the, the message needs to keep getting out there. Uh, it needs to get to the legislator. And mm -hmm. I, again, I, I just recently read a stat that the family court generates more money than all the other genres of courts put together. And I think it's even two or three times that amount. So imagine that the family court, you're talking about corporate, you're talking about criminal, all these things added together don't even come close to the money generated out of family court. There's something clearly wrong there. Absolutely clearly wrong. And then there's, and then a lot of times the trauma that it imposes mm -hmm. on a parent, especially the targeted parent. It, it is so traumatic to have, have their, your children and your rights just wrenched away from you mm -hmm. um, that it can certainly throw you into a post-traumatic stress, um, you know, disorder. And it's just in, and, and then of course, then you're made, you're painted to look unstable and yet it's the system that's caused that. Right. And I've been diagnosed with that now three times and to the point at which I'm now diagnosed as CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, I was first diagnosed with that uh, when the children were uh, abducted. I, I've been diagnosed with that when I went inside. Um, I've been diagnosed with that here. So, um, and I'm on some very severe medications for that including schizophrenia i mean you can't go walk into what you call a drugstore what we call here a chemist or a pharmacy and say give me a ptsd tablet there's no such animal you 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 have to take a combination of of chemicals to get some balances right with you um so it it it's horrific but but it also causes um, um underlying issues with the children and we all know mm -hmm. that but kids will end up with all sorts of things, detachments and, you know, insecurities, things that they would never have normally have had. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 what horrifies me in my story for my children is the fact if they ever do take their own journey, and I will not reach out to them and I've never allowed anyone to do that. But if they ever do find out the truth, they'll realize their whole life, including the people they've met, on her boyfriend's family side and everything they've done in between is a complete lie, is a complete myth. Imagine finding that out about your life. And, you know, so I, I, I fear for them when they find out the truth. I really do. And, and I, it's things, those are the kinds of things I have to stay away from, not thinking about for myself. Um, because, you know, I have a balcony here where I live and I'd be jumping right off the end of it. So you spent eight years in prison. No, more than that. I spent, I went, I was in there two years past my end of sentence. <laughs> you were sentenced to eight years? I, I was sentenced to 15, but it would be suspended after eight. I, um, I refused all the early release from about four years in, because uh, you can get, good time on all this kind of stuff and they wanted to get rid of me and I I declined because I would have to sign the sex, sex offender registry mm. and so when it came to my end of sentence uh, it was the week before maybe six days before uh, I was taken to a court um, you know just out of the blue and they arrested me uh, for failure to sign and then I spent two years um, doing that and then all of a sudden, um, I was illegally deported, um, found myself on the tarmac of JFK, which is the tarmac I actually 
landed in when I first arrived in the US in 88. But I was um, on the actual tarmac. My feet were on the tarmac surrounded by 100 TSA agents with guns. And, um, and they, uh, three of them, I, two, no, two or three, two, I think, two escorted me. Um, I was in a wheelchair, don't forget. Um, they escorted me all the way to England on the plane. Hmm. So that was their way of getting rid of you. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I predicted it, Danica and Wendy. I, 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 right. I actually predicted it. And the only thing I got wrong, and D Attorney David McGuire would tell you this, who's the boss of the ACLU in Connecticut. I, the only thing I got wrong was the time of day. I said, they'll come like thieves in the night, two o'clock in the morning, telling me I'm transferring and I'll start seeing signs for New York. They came at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking uh, a few minutes ago about um, the money that is generated by um, family court, um, that the money is actually made by the court appointed friends of the court, so to speak. Um, but uh, you both kind of segued into the emotional collateral of the family court. And I think that's so important for us to stress to viewers who are watching this who are not familiar with family court, if they haven't been through family court litigation, and this was touched on in the documentary Divorce Corp, is that um, family court litigants are much more prone to um, murder, suicide, um, yes. and really severe um, emotional trauma due to uh, the family court operations and I, I, it, yeah. and, and it's the moms and the dads and the kids. It's, it's everyone that is involved in that litigation. Oh, it, the, the evil of family court has no boundaries. It just, it just doesn't. Um, I, again, I, I refer to my female judge who was gracious and allow me a two week trial, which normally takes three days. I laid everything before the court. I couldn't have been more grateful and more happy, but I gave her four to five clear perjury um, uh, situations on the stand. And each time I went forward to uh, stop, you know, sort of like stop what I was doing and began to go down the path of asking for perjury, she cut me off and she would not allow me to say another word on that, uh, about, but about that. So, you know, it, 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 I mean, just clear, for example, and, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I know we don't have much time left, but she had said that when the car broke down, I went to pick her up. She told the police officer because her friend who was dating the police officer called the police. And she told the police officer when he asked that, cause he had, they have to take a lady to one side and ask certain questions. Do you fear him? This and the other. And she was like, no, everything's fine. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there was no issues at all. I was simply there to pick her up from a car breaking down. Or even though I knew she'd been out at the affair, we'd already chatted about that before um, the police officer came back. She got on the stand in the, in the family trial and said, I told the police officer I feared for my life and I wanted him out of the house. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I had the police report in my hand. I'd already submitted it for evidence. So the, the moment she said that, I then submitted, you know, submitted that piece of evidence on the record into the court. And the court accepted it. And it clearly said, the police officer clearly stated, I asked uh, her name, she said her name, um, you know, did she fear blab? And she told me, no, she did not. And everything was okay and fine. So in their orders, Judge Linda Munro stipulated that with the court fines that she did not say that to the police officer. Well, that was one of the moments I pulled, stopped the court to ask for a perjury claim of which she could have arrested. If she had arrested Jill with a bench, uh, she'd, uh, if she'd have made a bench warrant arrest at that moment, my criminal case would have gone away instantly. And it didn't. And, and that was five times that happened in that trial. So I know, I know it's, it's hard to talk about the kids and, and I don't want you to, you know, go into more detail than you want to, but something that I'm curious about is were the kids already being turned against you and being brainwashed against you before 
um, all of this happened uh, with the false allegations? Were they already um, being alienated from you or did that happen no. after or during the no, process? No, I think that happened the moment the arrest was made. Mm -hmm. I think that's when that process began uh, because as was found by Judge Linda Monroe, I was the nurturing parent. I was the emotional parent. You know, I bathed them. I dressed them. I played with them. I did, I did everything. We, there was a joke between our friends uh, and uh, myself and my ex-wife and our friends that I breastfed our children because she, I would prop her up in the bed and, and I encouraged her to try and stay asleep. And I had a situation with what I'd gotten to prop the baby in a position where the baby could feed on both sides. And I would put a little pin to make sure I remembered which one I finished off on. I would do all the feeding and she would sit there and basically be asleep through the whole thing. So, you know, that joke became a bit of a, a thing between all of our friends. So I know what kind of parent I was. And in fact, Judge Linda Monroe said, I was the superior parent and critical to be in the lives of the children. It got so bad that in my, my, my um, sentencing, which was three months after the criminal trial, the prosecutor, hideous, two hideous prosecutors, the, the head one who's thankfully now passed away and was, was investigated by the FBI and integral in, in my prosecution, and the woman who actually did the prosecution, awful people, and she got up to try and keep the children away from me while I was in prison. And the judge, who apparently was going to give me a high sentence and in the end gave me eight years, which is unheard of apparently, he stopped it in mid-flight and leaned forward. I remember his face to the day I die. And he said, counselor, he said, this case has been in front of a two-week family court regional target trial. And this court will not make any changes to that order. Is that clear? She had a tail between her legs, quicker than you can say boo to a goose. And she went, yes, you're on and sat, sat her backside down. Uh, you know, he read what I was to my children and what Judge Linda Munro had said. And it was ridiculous. Everybody knew she was lying and the jury found me guilty. One woman started crying. She knew I was innocent. I had a one day trial and it took two weeks for a verdict. That murder trials don't, don't take two weeks for a verdict. They took two weeks for a verdict. It, it was insane. Well, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, what I would like to know is what are you doing right now? Like you don't have a relationship with your children. You're living overseas. And um, so what's, what, are, what, are, what are you up to right now? Well, in terms of, I'm, I'm advocating against parental alienation, wrongful convictions and all that kind of thing. I, I you know, run some, um, you know, me, social media stuff. I do something on my case every single day. Um, I, you know, just pray one day that they will, you know, make their own journey. But for now, I just do what I can on my case every single day. There is, you know, some things I've got going on in the U.S. There's a potential for a massive media uh, situation, which I can't go into about my story. Um, and, and I'm praying to God, uh, you know, before the end of the year, I get positive news on that. Um, and, and that's all I can do. Um, you know, I, I have support of family um, who I try and see when I can, um, you know, and then keep myself entertained with, you know, uh, the New England Patriots, Liverpool Football Club, <laughs> and the New York Yankees, you know. Although I'm a bit of a fan of the Boston Red Sox right now because they own <laughs> my Liverpool team as well. So, um, yeah, you know, so that, that's basically what I try and do. And if I see somebody who needs help or they've reached out or whatever I can do, I will try and do that, you know, and try and spread the word as I'm doing here today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest and sharing um, and being vulnerable. Uh, I know it's, uh, I can't imagine, I can't imagine walking your sh in your shoes, but thank you. Hopefully it's made a difference to our viewers. And um, thank you. And I'm, I'm, ha I'm so grateful to you, Wendy, for, you know, inviting me onto the show. And anytime you ask me back, I'm more than happy to.
Awesome. Great. Okay, Wendy. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Bill, so much for joining us and, and for sharing so much of your story. Um, and I want to thank you for for still helping other families, you know, for being out there for other families. Um, I really appreciate that you do that. So I uh, just want to remind everyone watching that parental alienation can happen to anyone, so it should matter to everyone. So please help us spread the word uh, to everyone about parental alienation. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.